So on the one hand, I'm very excited to be joining this incredibly engaged department in terms of spreading the study of Asian American literature that covers over two centuries in the United States. But on the other hand, I'm interested in engaging Asian American as a name for a problem and a question. What does it mean to bring two desperate terms together? What does it mean to think about race through narrative? What does it mean to use the possibility of the imaginative archive to imagine solutions to real world problems? And what does it mean to think about art as fundamentally related to politics, but in a way where the politics don't determine art itself? And so that to me is something that I really want to pull from the research in terms of, yes, it is about people's stories, experiences, and histories, but also on the other hand, is a real aesthetic provocation to think differently about our relationship to the world. Hi everybody, welcome to Literature, Language, Culture. It's a dialogue series produced for the Department of English here at the University of Washington in Seattle. We now have social channels where you can keep up with the different episodes at UW underscore ENGL on Instagram and Twitter. And those are linked in the description below. And then in today's episode, Doug made many amazing references throughout it. And we have all of those cited for you below and a linked ongoing living reading list. That's where you can also find summaries of whatever you saw or didn't see come up on screen and it's screen reader friendly. And if you listen to the podcast issue, you can also go over to YouTube and see those different images come up if that helps your learning process. Either way, we hope you like and subscribe. It's one of the best ways to help the project. And Doug, on that note, will you introduce yourself so people know who they're listening to today or watching as it were? Yes, howdy and hello. I am Douglas, Professor Douglas S. Ishii. I'm new with the Department of English as of the 2020 academic year, and my focus is on Trans-Pacific Asian American literatures and culture. Doug, what did you bring to talk about with us today? What I brought is my entire Netflix roll of movies, because now that we're all in this pandemic and we are responsibly sheltering in place, I've just been watching a lot of the great rom-coms of the 21st century. So like a responsible Asian American studies scholar who is interested in media and intersecting lines of identity and difference, I want to rep the half of it, this delightful Netflix film that takes place in our dear Pacific Northwest. It is the second film by Alice Wu who made the first, dare I say first, Asian American lesbian rom-com, Saving Face. I haven't yet finalized the syllabus, but I'm thinking about teaching it in my Trans-Pacific Attachments course that brings up the field of Trans-Pacific studies and uses it as a lens for re-understanding Asian American narratives and experiences, such that we can think about this interconnection between the sleepy rom-com, Cyrano de Bergerac take, how that relates to these larger questions going on about on the one hand, sexuality and sexual orientation, and on the other hand, how an Asian American ends up working a train station. This also is part of a larger movement both in terms of media activists but then also within the film industry so we get these two levels of power invested in asian american representation but then we're also then connecting to other types of visibilities and other relationships to genre because i did not love it super much when it came out but now i'm all about it the crazy rich asians film adaptation from 2018 oh i can't get enough of it What's a useful working definition of queer of color in the context of today's episode? So when I teach classes on queer of color literature, we're aiming to do several things with this category of queer of color. On the one hand, we have the messy category queer, which on the one hand, when I hear it on the street, it's probably still a slur of some kind. But when we think about the history of activism from the 1980s and 1990s that reclaimed it, it's really, yet another sticky point about this capacious category for understanding identities, both in terms of gender, sex, and sexual orientation that mesh together, intertwine, break with our expectations. And then we add the of color addendum to really think about intersectionality, about on the one hand, stories, people, and experiences who inhabit the in-between spaces of on the one hand, being non-white in the United States, and on the other hand, existing in the sexual and gender margins of their communities, however broadly defined. 
but also it becomes this really interesting way of analyzing the social structure in terms of in what way has sexuality, which we consider to be this very private and intimate space, actually been very public in terms of being written into law and political representation and everyday culture at every level. To then also consider the visibility and invisibility of race in all of that. Why is it that, for example, there, are, there have been so many movements and cultural conversations in the past year about where are the non-white LGBTQ plus people? This then becomes a conversation about how do race and sexual orientation do or don't go together? Or when we think about people of color political representation, where are the range of voices that exist underneath the larger category of race? Where are the, where are people who identify as women? Where are the non-binary people? Where are the queer identified people? And how can this then shift our vision of what social justice looks like to consider multiple vectors of power and inequality at the same time. So some key texts that we'd go through in this course is really anchoring this vision in the Combahee River Collective, a Black Feminist Statement. And think about how these social movements from the 1950s to the 1970s have laid out this really interesting blueprint of what community, culture, and politics could look like if we really attended to these intersecting dimensions of identity and difference. One text along this Trans-Pacific thread that kind of speaks to both fields is I'm really in love with Ocean Vuong. Not only their poetry, but also their novel, <laughs> On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. The first time I taught the novel was literally in the pandemic. And so I asked students to really sort of trace images as it goes across the different chapters. I'm like, what is the butterfly doing here as opposed to there? Because there's this real poetic sensibility that gets melded into the prose that also it, in its own way is queer because it challenges this formal expectation of like sitting down with your favorite novel in the bathtub. What is the half of it? And what, what is the field of trans-specific studies? Like, what do you mean when you say that? I'm interested in trans-specific literature and don't hold me to it, right? Because there are some people who have done amazing work both within academia, but also in political activism that shuttles across multiple continents across the body of water that is not empty, but in fact contains multitudes of life that we also have to take seriously. The term Trans-Pacific has arisen within the past decade, kind of riffing on the Trans-Pacific promise made about the 21st century. Because if policy and economics say that the Trans-Pacific is this perfect partnership between the US and Asia, very narrowly defined as the economically ascendant nations, Trans-Pacific studies comes in to then look at what falls underneath all that? Who are the people who are shuttled back and forth? Under what conditions and contexts? What are the human and non-human ecologies that are affected through this pushing back and forth? Who and what follows money at whose expense? And what are the new possibilities for reimagining the planet if we really challenge this limited vision of globalization? So on the one hand, this is new in terms of pulling together, for example, the influence of the transatlantic from Black studies in thinking about the realities of migration, immigration, and economics and cultural flows that go back and forth without, con without being stopped by national boundaries, as well as just the way that people have survived through and outside of identity categories, right? If there's something really important still about insisting that Asian American is about a domestically defined racialized group within the United States. There's also the reality that 66% of the Asian American population was not born in the United States. So what are the stories of going back and forth that both insist on the centrality of race and US imperialism without erasing this context for like a single identity? How do we get from the half of it to um to Crazy Rich Asians? And how do you go from being like, uh-uh, about a film to like, I can't get enough of the film? And what does that have to do with the work that you do? One of the questions I'm really interested in in my research and my teaching is that we have this category Asian American that feels laid out before us. We understand it in terms of census forms and applications. And part of what I do through teaching is really restore that activist history 
through which we have this category that can help unify different Asian American ethnic communities, nationalities, and people with different relationships to citizenship through this political stance of coming together as one. So then being a literary studies scholar, I'm really interested in things that call themselves and get called Asian American. If we think about this growing media and film archive, we're then paying attention to, I ask my students to pay attention to what everyday people and journalists and think pieces are saying that can help add to our understanding of what's interesting or innovative or interrupting or disruptive about different representations. Of course, I'm a big old contrarian. And so Crazy Rich Asians comes out summer 2018. Asian Americans and critics of all races and ethnicities are all about it. And therefore I walk in with a certain type of cynicism, but ooh, did I cry during that wedding scene? If you have not seen it, you should definitely watch it too, because then it forces us to think about what is visibility. In the case of Crazy Rich Asians, number one, it's being on screen, but number two, it's being glitz and glamor and all the trappings of largesse that we associate both with a particular Hollywood moment, as well as it, what it means to be part of the ascendant global capitalist class that they so represent. But it gets bundled through this language of grassroots politics that we associate with things that are pan-ethnic and politicized Asian American. I'm interested in getting into those sticky spots where the narratives that we're given start to conflict and contradict and don't fully make sense together. It's also why I'm really drawn to genre because, oh, do I love a good rom-com? Do I love a good horror? Do I love a good action movie? These are not things that we associate with the filmic or literary canon, but uh, applying the lens of genre, we can better understand how people are playing around with convention to interrupt and intervene in the given. Can you give an example of what you mean by that stickiness in Crazy Rich Asians, right? Because that's a film that like lots of people have seen. And what I'm hearing is there's a sort of like friction between what you're terming as sort of grassroots rhetoric, right? And like this global ascension and capitalism in order to like be able to move anywhere and liquidate your assets. Right? So think with me. Okay. I'm really interested in the opening scene because number one, in terms of form, that's our point of entry into this narrative and into this world that is ours, but not ours. We start out with the global diasporic children, right? The two Asian kids running through the rain into the hotel where then they and their mother experience this very obvious racist aggression from the hotel staff. And the big turnaround that then is the surprise that flips us into the movie is that it turns out she is incredibly wealthy and purchases the hotel out from underneath the staff and the proprietor. And that's the moment that when I was watching it in this predominantly Asian American theater, people cheered in this moment of recognition of finally getting our comeuppance against this structured system of racism that has been militated against Asian and Asian Americans since the 18th century. However, in thinking about this as a sticky moment, is the question really whether or not we have the money to buy things from other people? Or is it about seeking a sense of justice and recognition for the otherwise dehumanizing and uh, delegitimized experiences of injury and hurt that happen at all levels of experience? Because when I talk about Asian American as a grassroots category, I'm asking us to think about this activist history. When people we now understand as Asian American were organizing alongside Latinx, Native American, and Black American people in order to collectively transform U.S. American society, as well as its relationship to the globe. What, what about that stickiness is interesting, besides just the contradiction, you know what I mean? So like, what, do you, what does that have to do with right now and COVID-19? What does it have to do with the terms like trans-Pacific studies, right? What, what about that do you think is generative? What I think is so interesting in thinking about moments that are sticky or contradictory or paradoxical that I find particularly germane to study through narrative is that they can open up a different world of possibilities and imagining our place with each other and with the world. In my research, I think a lot about ambivalence and embeddedness as two key ways of thinking about how there is no perfect political agenda, but also the world that we're living in is rife with inequalities of all kinds. So what does it mean to live in this moment as 
a person who wants to do good and be better and contribute something worthwhile without having that agenda laid out before you. By agenda, I mean, there's no clear way, especially when we historicize a lot of the things that we consider to be really good. So one of the fields that I do research in, but also actively teach is in critical university studies. In thinking about the university on the one hand as an engine for the establishment and develop and spread of knowledge, but then also as this sticky site of, for example, external and state funding in terms of perpetuating the military and the prison industrial complex, in terms of being a nexus of global finance and property investment, as well as for all of you students watching, what happens with your tuition? I can tell you, it doesn't go straight to my pockets. So what are the different ways that this money's being used and how can narrative help us either cover over those contradictions or make them even more apparent such that we can work towards transforming this public institution that is in name and spirit working for us. So critical university studies as an intellectual field, as well as a subset of activism is really about challenging the direction that the kind of centralized profiteering university has gone. If we're thinking very much about what's happened in 2020, many institutions of higher education are particularly beset by financial crisis. While at the same time boasting about how many billions of dollars exist in the endowment. So there's a real question here about the day-to-day -day operations of this institution. That's what makes critical university studies critical about asking these questions of what seems like this sort of transcendent collection of classrooms and professors and ideas. It also is very interested in the flows of money as well as the flows of people. So if we think about, for example, in the city of Seattle, the University of Washington makes up such a large amount of not only middle and upper middle class jobs, but also working class jobs that are underpaid and underrepresented. So what does it mean for the university to be this engine, not only of upward mobility, but for some people's downward mobility, which is not really what falls in our understanding of like what the university is. So in my undergraduate class on critical university studies, which flies under the larger heading of literatures of social difference, I really want to impress upon students that there is a history, but also a very recent history of student protest. So at the very beginning of the quarter, we contextualize this student activism led by black students at the University of Washington from across 2020, and really thinking about those demands in connection with, for example, centralizing the student strikes for ethnic studies at San Francisco State College in 1968. So even though to students it's worlds away, it's also more recent than the way that they're used to considering history. So some of the critical texts that get involved include Christopher Newfield's Remaking the Public University, which provides this history of, on the one hand, the public institution of higher learning alongside the history of what we now call diversity alongside Roderick Ferguson's We Demand that provides a history of how these radical student movements from the 1950s through the 1970s, on the one hand, kind of become the everyday language of the institution when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also ask questions about what happened to these demands to, for example, make sure that every program has an investment in community as opposed to an investment in upward mobility. So if like we're talking to students and we're talking to like folks that are very invested in higher ed, what's the like friction counterpoint to this like commodification of education? So the university is such an interesting place because it encapsulates so much of what we call the American dream. So on the one hand, in both my research and teaching, we, we reveal the different fault lines within that narrative while also still holding on to the promise of individual and social transformation that it so embodies. So one way of thinking about what we can do with the university, once we trace where the money goes, once we deconstruct the stories that perpetuate the narrative about, for example, uh, the university as a place where straight cis white men experience their becoming is then to focus on the marginalized and the minoritized voices and think about these histories of activism that have had an impact that still lingers within the university itself. So when we think about, for example, student retention programs, when we think about 
interdisciplinary engagements throughout the humanities and social sciences by the names of ethnic studies, women and gender and sexuality studies, as well as radical class critique. These are different ways of exploring that the university is not just a top-down institution. And in fact, students can claim their voice and their power and do something to transform these institutions that govern our everyday life. Do you feel like part of that is that historical piece you mentioned? So you mentioned that like there is this deeper history of like activists and authors and artists that students can study and learn from, right? Um, mm -hmm. Do you, can you give some context for that actually? Like the historical moorings that it might offer that you wouldn't, you would get elsewhere, but maybe differently. So when I think about key figures that help us think about the relationship between the everyday person and the social movement and the university, the first person who comes to mind is Fred Moten. Fred Moten and his partner, Stefan O'Harney have written these sort of visionary and illuminary illuminating pieces about the university in the 21st century, where in my classes, I asked students to really sort of abandon their expectations of why they came to college, because I'm sure it's similar to the reasons why I went. You get promised that you get a degree and then you'll get the job that you want as well as class mobility. But then as you, you're in college, you hear more and more about the stark job possibilities that exist across every institution and every industry. But there's still hope, right? Because no matter what happens, there's always space within the classroom as a site of discussion, as a sort of staging ground of the democracy that we want to be, that is on the one hand informed, but on the other hand, egalitarian, where everyone has a voice, but on the other hand, there is a direction and a goal to reach at together that I really want to hold on to, that I think is still the promise of the public university in the 21st century. So when students read the undercommons with me, one question that I really have is what are your expectations of the university? And then what are your expectations of what resistance looks like in the university? What we find is that we end up in this very back and forth model where of course, if more people did it, we would have this wonderful democracy going on of on the one hand, there are these demands made about class status and occupation and expectation met with student input, student feedback, and at times student resistance to it. But what I find so interesting about the undercommons is that Moten and Harney locate that this is indeed a feedback loop. So what are the other possibilities as well as how do the possibilities that we think of, how are they already playing back into this feedback loop? In doing so, I'm also interested in this larger goal in the classroom, especially the general education classroom of things perhaps have become a little simplified in our mainstream discourse. There's a yes, then there's a no, there's a right and there's a left, but what about the entire gamut of possibilities that fall between and outside these options? Which is why I remain invested in literary studies as taking the narratives that were given and then picking them apart and maybe even shattering them at times to then see where power inheres, but also where there's possibility for human agency.